Hello again and welcome back. In this video we're going to be introduced to aorist participles and participles are a new category of verbal adjectives that we haven't looked at yet. So let's see how they work. Participles are the fourth verbal mood we've learned. The first was the indicative which was just ordinary verbs. Uh, the imperative that we use to give commands. The infinitive which, as we've seen, are verbal nouns, and now participles. And a participle is a verbal adjective. It allows a whole clause to tell us more about some word in the main clause. And sometimes, we'll, as we'll see, they modify a noun or a nominal, and they tell us more about that nominal. Uh, and sometimes that uh, participial clause, the clause that's led by a participle, uh, will tell us more about the verb and the action of the main verb. Uh, but the basic idea of a participle uh, at the heart of those clauses is that it's a verbal idea packed up to act like an adjective. Why learn aorist participles first? After all, we learned present verbs before we learned aorist verbs. Well, this is because the aorist tense is the default or unmarked tense for participles. That means you'll see a lot more uh, aorist participles than any other tense. And uh, when you see an aorist participle, it w the tense won't really mean anything in particular. Uh, this is just the default tense. Uh, it'll be when we see later on uh, present tense participles that that adds e extra meaning to the meaning of the participle itself. Here's some examples of participles in English, because if you're like me, uh, you didn't pick up a, a good definition of participles in school when you learned your English. Um, a participle in English is formed by adding ing to the end of the, uh, the, end of the uh, verb. Um, there is another construction called a gerund uh, in English, which also adds ing to the end of the uh, verb, but a gerund is a noun. Uh, here we're dealing with adjectives. So this is a verb ending in ing that describes some other word. Uh, an example would be running in the running girl is fast. Running there is the verb run plus ing and it's describing the girl. A flying bird looks free. Flying there is a participle in English and it describes the activity of the bird. Uh, we could say, while we were shopping, we bought bread. Uh, and their shopping uh, describes the, the we a little bit more. It tells us what the we were doing. Or, because you are fighting, you can't have ice cream. Uh, fighting there is another participle. Here are the parts of a first aorist active participle. And now, over the next few slides, I'm going to be showing you a whole lot of examples of participles, and you're going to see some charts with uh, a lot of forms packed on them. What I want you to realize is the point of this is not to memorize each individual form. The point instead is to notice what the markers are uh, and the components are that make up uh, a participle. So sort of like Lego, you'll be able to put together a participle to mean what you want it to mean without having to, to remember every single form separately. So a participle is formed beginning with the verbal stem. And even though this is an aorist active participle, um, because we're not in the indicative mood, there won't be an augment. So remember, the augment only shows up on aorist verbs in the indicative mood, um, because that's the only mood in which the aorist indicates time. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, the aorist doesn't indicate anything to do with time in uh, participles. It, it just is the basic form of a participle. So without the augment, we begin with the verbal stem. And here's our uh, sample verb lu luo with the stem lu. And the tense marker of the first aorist is sigma. That's familiar to us. The connecting vowel uh, that follows the sigma in the first aorist is an alpha. That's also familiar. 
Um, and what we're going to see is adjective endings, adjective case endings on the end. And uh, in this case, uh, we're putting on a uh, genitive singular third declension case ending os. And so this is the uh, genitive singular form. So one of the things that is a little bit confusing about uh, participles is that they're verbs, but they take adjective endings, which of course are the same as noun endings. Uh, that makes participles a little bit of a hybrid, but it also means that all of the endings you're going to need, you've already learned because you learned them when you learned about nouns and adjectives. The one unique part uh, of the uh, first aorist active participle here is the uh, two letters in brown that are called the voice indicator. Uh, and here it's a nun tau, uh, or, or sorry, nu tau. And uh, this is a, a piece, a component, that we don't have in other kinds of verbs. All of this does is tell us whether the participle is active or middle. So here we have Lusantos, and uh, the sigma alpha tells us that we're dealing with the first aorist uh, tense. The nun tau, uh, the brown letters, tell us that we're dealing with an active voice participle, and the os ending tells us that we're dealing with either a masculine or neuter genitive singular uh, form. Let's look at an example of uh, see how this fleshes itself out in uh, a full range of forms for Luo. All right, again, the point here isn't to memorize all of these forms, but I want you to notice the patterns. Uh, just like adjectives, participles can be masculine, feminine, or neuter, and they can come in any of the five cases. Um, even though they're verbs, they have these features of, of case and gender and number. But notice that in every single uh, form across the chart, the aorist, first aorist participle begins with the verb stem, and then we have the sigma uh, tense marker of the first aorist. Then we have the alpha connecting vowel following the tense marker. And then we have the uh, voice indicator, which tells us in this case that uh, these are all active participles. Now, uh, the voice indicator in the masculine and neuter active is nu tau. Uh, and so uh, the uh, basic uh, core form of the participle will be lucent, and then we'll add the endings onto the end of that. For the feminine, we have a different tense indicator, and it's just a sigma. And so the core of the participle will be lusas plus the ending. Um, once you uh, have that uh, voice indicator, then all you have to do is add on uh, noun endings. Now, in the uh, masculine nominative and vocative singular and the neuter nominative accusative and vocative singular, um, we don't have the voice indicator. Uh, we will have a voice indicator when we make middle participles, uh, and so it in practice isn't very confusing that the active voice indicator isn't there. But for active participles, we don't have the new tau, uh, we don't have the lucent in those uh, exceptions, the nominative in the masculine and neuter, uh, the neuter accusative, and the vocative in the masculine and neuter. Um, instead, it, we just have the ending stuck right on to the connecting vowel. So instead of lucents for the nominative masculine singular, we're just going to have lusas. But if you remember that all that's happening is the uh, uh, voice indicator is being left off, then those forms won't uh, trip you up too much. Then the endings in the masculine and neuter are basically third declension endings. And the, in the feminine, you're going to use first declension endings. So this is going to be like one of those 3-1-3 adjectives, where in the masculine and neuter, they used third declension endings, and in the feminine, they used first declension endings. Um, 
again, the uh, exceptions here are the same uh, forms where we don't have a tense indicator. And in the nominative masculine singular, we just have lusas. And so the, the ending is just a sigma. Uh, that's one that you'll have to remember. Uh, and in the neuter, uh, this is a little bit more familiar um, from our second declension neuter endings. We're just going to stick a new on the end. So this is going to be lusan. Uh, this uh, nominative masculine singular form is, of course, carried over identically into the vocative. And the neuter nominative singular is the same form that's going to be reused in the accusative and the vocative, uh, which is standard for neuter endings. But aside from those irregular endings, all of the other endings are just perfectly regular uh, third declension noun endings in the masculine and neuter, and first declension noun endings in the feminine. Notice in the feminine that the uh, nominative singular ending is going to be an alpha rather than an eta. That's because it's following the sigma here. So it's going to be lusasa, but then it, we switch immediately into the eta endings. Lusases, lusase with the iota subscript and the dative, lusasain in the accusative, and lusasa again in the vocative. If we move to plurals, the plural forms of participles are even easier to put together like Lego. Uh, again, you can see here that in almost every form, we have the sigma tense marker, the alpha connecting vowel, and then the new tau uh, uh, voice indicator. Um, so the nominative masculine singular is going to be lusantes. So the core there is lusant, and then we add the plural noun ending afterward. Uh, the two places where, uh, again, the voice indicator is left out uh, are in the date of masculine and neuter plural. And why is that? Because if we try and add the C date of plural ending on the end of lusant, it becomes very difficult to pronounce. Uh, it would be lusant C. And that collapsed in pronunciation into just lusasi. So the, the new tau effectively are absorbed by the sigma of the date of plural ending. But aside from the date of plurals, the uh, plural first aorist participles are even more regular than the singulars were. And again, if we focus on the uh, adjective and noun endings that are being used here, uh, you can see that the, it's the third declension plural endings that show up in the masculine and neuter, and the first declension plural endings that show up in the feminine. Again, it's a 3-1-3 three, three pattern. All right, so uh, let's remind ourselves here, again, that we're not memorizing all of these forms. What we want to remember is the components that make up uh, any participle. So for the active participles, first aorist active participles, we've got the stem, the tense marker, the connecting vowel, which is an alpha, our voice indicator, which is new tau in the uh, masculine and neuter active, and sigma in the feminine active, and then case endings, uh, third declension for the masculine and neuter, and first declension for the uh, feminine. If we remember those components and remember the features of second aorist verbs, uh, then you can probably put together the second aorist forms without really having to think about uh, learning any uh, new paradigms or anything. Uh, now, uh, just like with second aorist active verbs, we're going to use the second aorist stem of the verb. So if we uh, use erkamai as our example, uh, the uh, aorist active form of erkamai was aelthon. And now remember, we have to shorten the eta at the beginning of aelthon uh, because we're removing the augment, and the augment was what made the, that eta long. So the stem, the second aorist stem is just going to be elth. For the second aorist, there's no tense marker, just like in the uh, active verbs. And now the connecting vowel is again an omicron, 
instead of an alpha. Uh, we use the same voice indicator in the masculine and neuter active, the same new tau. The only difference in uh, the voice indicator is that uh, now instead of just a sigma in the feminine, we're going to have an upsilon sigma. And that's because there's actually an epsilon sigma voice indicator there, but the epsilon combines with the omicron connecting vowel to make omicron upsilon sigma, an us uh, uh, form uh, with the connecting vowel and the voice indicator together. Um, so the aorist stem, no tense marker, omicron connecting vowel, the voice indicator, and then exactly the same uh, case endings that we saw with the first aorist. So there's really nothing uh, much new to learn here, uh, except to notice the different form, form of the voice indicator, and then just remember the, the ways in which second aorist verbs differed uh, in the first place from first aorist verbs. Here are all the forms for the uh, second aorist active participle of uh, erkamai in the singular. You'll notice here again that we have the same irregular forms in the masculine nominative and the neuter nominative, and then the other masculine and neuter forms that are usually identical to the nominative, the vocative in the masculine and the accusative and vocative in the neuter. Um, but aside from those, uh, you'll notice that we have, uh, again, uh, perfectly uh, regular uh, forms with the verb stem, the second aorist stem, omicron connecting vowel, and then the voice indicator, nu tau in the masculine and neuter, and uh, upsilon sigma in the feminine. So we have either elthont or elthus as the core of the uh, second aorist participle here. The uh, irregular masculine nominative singular form is uh, going to leave out that uh, tense indicator, as is the irregular neuter uh, nominative form, uh, and it's left out again in the accusative and vocative uh, neuter as well. But aside from those, uh, all of these forms have the identical components right up until the ending. And if we look at the endings, once again, all of these endings are the same as we saw with first aorist participles. Third declension uh, noun and adjective endings in the masculine and neuter, and first declension in the feminine. We've still got our alpha ending in the feminine nominative singular, and then eta endings from there on. Um, the ending in the masculine uh, nominative singular is irregular, just like it was as in the uh, first aorist participle. Here it's going to be own. Uh, that's one ending that you've just got to remember, and then it shows up in the vocative as well. Uh, with the neuter, uh, the irregular ending again looks just like it did in the first aorist participle, where there we just put a new on the end of the uh, uh, verb form, just right after the connecting vowel. Here again, we put a new right after the connecting vowel. It's just the, the connecting vowel with the second aorist is an omicron. So the neuter nominative singular will be elthon, but then we'll have elthon toss, elthon t, and elthon again in the accusative and in the vocative. And with plurals, uh, again, like with the first aorist, the plurals are even more regular. In all of these forms, we start with the aorist, second aorist stem, add the omicron uh, tense marker, and in all but two forms, we add the same uh, voice indicator and then the plural noun endings. Uh, and the two irregular plural forms are the same ones that were irregular in the uh, um, in the first aorist. It's those date of plurals, where effectively all we do is um, uh, drop the new, uh, new tau. Uh, but here, just like with feminine uh, participles, the feminine voice indicator got that extra upsilon before the sigma. So the same thing happens here. 
we get an extra upsilon in the dative uh, plural forms. So instead of just elthosi, we have elthusi. Uh, but if you remember those uh, irregular dative plurals, again, this is all just a matter of sticking the components together like Lego. And there are our uh, plural case endings, third declension in the masculine and neuter plural, and first declension in the feminine plural. And uh, here, once again, the, the uh, case endings in the plural are all completely regular. So here is one chart that puts together the uh, components, the, the uh, Lego pieces that we need to put together to make any uh, aorist active participle, whether it's first aorist or second aorist. Uh, you, you can see for the first aorist, the top two rows, we have lu, the stem, plus the sigma tense marker, plus alpha connecting vowel, and then our voice indicator. Nu tau in the masculine and neuter, and sigma in the feminine, and then we add our case endings. Uh, third declension in the masculine and neuter, and first declension in the feminine. For the uh, second aorist active participles, we just have the second aorist stem, no tense marker, and an omicron connecting vowel, the same as with second aorist active indicative verbs. We have the same new tau voice indicator in the masculine and uh, neuter, and an upsilon sigma voice indicator for the second aorist feminine. And then uh, the same case endings that we used in the first aorist. Third declension case endings for the masculine and neuter, and first declension case endings for the uh, second aorist feminine active forms. All right. Um, those forms will be absorbed as you work with them in the exercises. Again, the, the important thing at this point is just to uh, get a clear sense of the components that make up a participle and how they fit together. Um, but what do uh, participles mean? Well, the first uh, use of a participle is as what we call a substantive participle. This is just like a substantive adjective. Um, you know, with the adjective uh, red, if we put uh, the uh, in front of it, put the article in front of it, uh, it becomes the red one, or the red thing, or the red person. Uh, we saw how substantive adjectives worked uh, back when we learned about adjectives. Well, participles are verbal adjectives, so we can do the same thing. Uh, and with a substantive adjective, we add the one who, or the man who, or the woman who, in front of the uh, verbal idea. For example, ha elthon would be the one who comes, uh, elthon being the uh, second aorist uh, masculine nominative singular form of erkamai, uh, I come or I go. Similarly, hey, so this is feminine, hey kalesasa will be the woman who calls. We know it's the woman because it's feminine in form, and uh, this is from kaleo, uh, I call. Notice again that I'm not translating these as past tenses, so it's not the one who came or the one who called, it's the one who comes and the one who calls. Uh, the aorist tense doesn't indicate time uh, now. In fact, it doesn't indicate anything in particular, it's just the basic form of the verb when we're dealing with par participles. How can we tell that we're dealing with a substantive participle? And so we should put the one who, or the man who, or the woman who in front of the verbal idea. Well, the basic indicator is that we have the definite article in front. A definite article in front of the participle form is usually a, a fairly sure indication that you've got a substantive. Another indicator, even if you don't have the article, is if the participle is in a case other than the nominative, because usually uh, it's only uh, in substantive participles that we get the other cases. That means, by the way, that the large majority of the participles you're going to see are nominative in form, 
um, some genitive as well but the dative the accusative certainly the vocative are quite uh, rare in comparison here's an example of a clause or a sentence rather that uses a, uh, a substantive participle ha elthone the one who comes and uh, notice that elthone because it's it it is a verb, uh, even though it's a verbal uh, adjective, it is a verb, so it can have its own clause. Um, so the, the participial clause, the clause that uh, is gathered around the participle, is elthon te basileia. Uh, so ha elthon te basileia is the one, ha, who, and now the, the participle elthon is going to tell us more about that one that's represented by the ha. This is not just any person, but this is the person who comes te basileia into the kingdom. So te basileia is modifying the participle as part of the participial clause, and then the participial clause is connected to the main clause uh, essentially through the definite article, which stands for uh, a, a noun slot in the main clause. Uh, since this is nominative, ha is nominative, this is actually the subject of the verb in the main clause, uh, and so the one who comes into the kingdom is the subject of estin. So the one who comes into the kingdom is estin, good, agathos. And agathos is also in the nominative here because it's the uh, uh, complement of uh, uh, ha elthon. The other way that participles are often used is adverbially. Now this may seem a little bit strange, uh, aren't we dealing with verbal adjectives? But adjectives in general are often used as adverbs in Greek. So uh, in this case the action of the participle modifies the action of the main verb. Um, the subject of both actions is usually the same, and we end up translating the participle as if it were a regular indicative verb with the same subject as the subject of the main verb. Uh, but we need to, to, when we translate it, convey the idea that uh, there's a relationship between the participial action and the main verb action. And so we're going to use some helper adverbs to indicate uh, what that relationship is. Uh, this will become clearer in a moment when we look at some examples, but uh, just before we get there, how do we know that we're dealing with an adverbial participle? Well, usually if a participle isn't substantive, it's being used adverbially. Uh, the vast majority of participles are either one or the other in Greek. And actually adverbial participles are more common, and we're going to see uh, that actually real Greek uses adverbs or uh, adverbial participles all over the place, which is why it's important to get these uh, clear. Usually adverbial participles will be in the nominative, occasionally in the genitive as well, but usually in the nominative. There will be no preceding article. Uh, the term for a, a word without an article is anarthrous, uh, if you want to get the technical term. And the uh, 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 um, gender and number of the participle will agree with the main verb's uh, gender and number. Uh, but aside from that, um, really the, the uh, clearest indicator that we're dealing with an adverbial participle is the lack of a definite article. So, how do we actually uh, use a participle adverbially? Uh, we have to think about the different specific ways in which the participle can modify the verb. In other words, what are the specific relationships that can stand between the participial action and the main action, the action of the main verb? One of those relationships is temporal, time. So the, the adverbial participle in this case is answering the question when. The main action is happening after the participial action. And usually when we deal with a temporal adverbial participle, we translate it with the word after. 
so El Thon Te Pole uh, is the participial uh, clause here, uh, coming into the city. Um, but this is uh, an adverbial participle, so we're going to translate it as a, a regular uh, verb. And uh, the main verb is parusamai, it's first person singular. So we're going to translate elthon as a first person singular as well, because the participle and the main verb share the same subject. So instead of just coming into the city, it will be I come into the city, or I come into the town, or I come to the town, as I've translated it there. Now, I come to the town is telling us more about the action of the main clause. And what's that main uh, action? Porusamai es te agora. I will go into the market. So what's the relationship between I come to the town and I will go into the market? If this is a temporal participle, uh, the relationship is one of time. And the uh, uh, participial action happens first, and the main verb act action happens after that. So we would translate this, uh, after I come into the town, or after I come to the town, I will go porusamai es te agora, into the market. Here's another example of one of those uh, temporal adverbial participles. Mis thosas ergaten is the uh, participial uh, clause. Uh, this is from misthao, which is to hire, and ergates, which is a worker. So ergaten is the object of the participle, uh, making up that participial clause. And this has to do with hiring a worker. Misthosas ergaten. Uh, notice that uh, the main verb uh, is egorasen, down at the end of the main clause, and that is a third person singular uh, main verb. So we're going to translate misthosas as a third person singular verb as well. Uh, in this case, uh, since Simon, Simon is the subject of egorasen, it's Simon that's the subject of the hiring as well. And so we're going to say he uh, hires a worker. Uh, so the participial clause has to do with him hiring a worker. Uh, the main clause tells us that Simon tinexulon egorasen. Simon uh, bought tinexulon, some wood. So the main clause is Simon buying some wood. Simon bought some wood. And somehow th there's a relationship between that action of buying and him uh, hiring a worker. If it's a temporal relationship, they're related in time. The hiring of the worker happened first, and the main verb happens afterwards. So we're going to translate this with the helper word after. After he had hired a worker, or we could just say after he hired a worker, Simon bought some wood. Simon tinaxulon egorasen. Sometimes a participle answers the question, why? Or what's the cause of the uh, action in the main verb? The participial action, in other words, is the cause of the main action. Often we use the helper words because or since when we translate uh, this kind of adverbial participle. So for example, we could write oikodome santos oikonmu nun plutos estin. Because he built my house, he is now rich. Now we're saying oikodome santos, that's from oikodomeo, and that's a masculine nominative singular uh, aorist participle. Uh, so uh, we're talking about the same subject as the subject of estin. So it could be she or it, but in this case, I'll assume it's he. He built oikonmu, he built my house. That's the uh, participial clause. And the main clause is nun plutos estin. Now he is rich. And what's the relationship between he built my house and now he is rich? Well, if it's a causal 
participle, the relationship is one of cause. So we'd say, because he built my house, he is now rich. Sometimes an adverbial participle can convey the purpose or result of the verb in the main clause. In these cases, the participle is answering the question why, as in what's the purpose of the main verb, or with what result does the action of the main verb take place. Often this kind of participial uh, uh, clause is translated with helper words like so that or in order that. So for example, we might read labon dua denaria arton mu polo. And here the participial clause uses lambano, labon. And uh, again, that's a masculine nominative singular form, second uh, aorist participle. So we're saying, uh, who's doing the taking? Uh, well, polo is a third, uh, or, sorry, a first person singular verb. So we use a first person singular subject for the participle when we translate. So this is going to be, I take or I receive duo denaria, two uh, denarii. I receive two denarii, and the main clause is arton mu polo, I am selling my bread. So what's the relationship between I receive two denarii and I am selling my bread? Well, maybe the receiving two denarii uh, is the um, purpose. So I'd say, so that I, now, since it's the purpose, it, it has to be future here because the main verb is present. So, so that I will receive two denarii, I am selling my bread. Again, notice how the, the time of the participle, uh, when we translate it, really has to be inferred from context and from the relationship of the participle to the main verb. So if the... Uh, uh, the main verb is present, and we're talking about the participle communicating its purpose, then probably the participle should be translated as a future, because the, the uh, purpose or result hasn't happened yet. Sometimes an adverbial participle can be conditional. Here the participle answers the question, on what condition? The participial action is the condition that must be fulfilled for the main action to happen. And often we translate uh, these participial clauses using the helper word if. We might read, Zesas hopateremu presbuteros esten. So the participial clause here uh, uses zao, uh, I live. And uh, the main verb is third person singular, so we would say, uh, he lives, but we actually have an explicit subject for the participle here. So we can say, my father, hapateremu, my father uh, lives. And the main clause is presbuteros uh, esten. He is an old man. He is an elder. So what's the relationship between my father lives and he is an old man? Well, maybe the participial clause is a condition for the main clause to be true. If my father is alive, if my father lives, presbuteros esten, he is an old man. Sometimes an adverbial participle can be concessive. In these cases, the participle answers the question, in spite of what? Um, in spite of what? does the main verb happen. The participial action here seems to conflict with the action of the main verb, but uh, despite the apparent conflict, the action of the main verb is still true. Often we translate these participles using helper words like although or even though. So we might read elthon apohelados uproskuno te artemidi. Although I come from Greece, I do not worship Artemis. Here the participial clause is uh, using a form of erchemai, an aorist participle of erchemai. The main verb is a first person singular, so we're going to use the same person to translate elthon. 
So it's going to be I come, and I come apohelados, I come from Greece. I come from Greece is the participial clause. Uh, ou proskuno te Artemidi is the main clause. I do not worship Artemis, Artemidi. Um, so what's the relationship between saying, I come from Greece and I do not worship Artemis? Uh, well, maybe uh, this is concessive. So uh, we would normally expect someone from Greece to worship Artemis, but we're going to say, although I come from Greece, elthon apohelados, I do not worship Artemis. Ou proskuno te Artemidi. Finally, an adverbial participle can convey the means or manner uh, in which the action of the main verb takes place. Uh, in this case, the participle is answering the question, how? Um, this can mean one of two things. Either the participial action describes the way in which, the manner in which, the main action happens, or the participial action is the means by which the main action is performed. And in practice, although grammarians will often distinguish between a participle of means and a participle of manner, the line between the two of them is often quite fuzzy, and often it's hard to, to draw a sharp line in practice between the two, which is why I'm sort of lumping them together here. But often, uh, either one of these uh, kinds of participles will be translated using the helper word by, or simply by using the ing form of the English verb. So we read ergasas en nukti, etelas en ton oikon. Um, ergasas en nukti, this is from ergazo, uh, I work, and the verb is third person singular, so this is going to be she work, uh, she works, or he works, uh, and this is working en nukti, uh, she works or he works at night. The main clause then says, etelesen ton oikon, uh, he finished the house. What's the relationship between uh, him working at night and him finishing the house? Well, uh, maybe uh, this is the means by which he finished the house. So we would say, by working at night, etelesen ton oikon, he finished the house. That's a lot to take in all at once, and uh, you'll become more familiar with this as you go through some exercises in Paideia. But um, here's a summary of the kinds of adverbial participles that I've introduced you to here. Remember that, that a participle is a verbal adjective. In this case, the verbal adjective is being used adverbially to modify the main verb, the action of the main verb. And the different kinds of adverbial participles are different kinds of relationship between the action in the participle and the action in the main verb. Uh, so it can be temporal, in which case we use the helper word after. It can be causal, in which case we might use because. It can be the purpose or result, in which case we might use so that or in order that to help translate. It can be a conditional relationship in which case we might translate the participle using if. It can be concessive, uh, and we might use although, and it can convey the means or manner uh, in which the main verb uh, action takes place, in which case we might use by, or might just translate the uh, participle using the ing form uh, of the English verb. Now, uh, I realize that this is a lot to take in all at once, but let me just add one other small uh, detail uh, which will have a big payoff. Um, I didn't want to introduce middle participles right away after you had uh, been introduced to the forms of active aorist participles. I'm just going to introduce them at the end here because they're really, really, really simple. All that you have to do to make an aorist participle middle, whether it's first aorist or second aorist, is change the voice indicator. Change it from the nuntau or the sigma to men, uh, uh, mu uh, epsilon nu. 
And so uh, instead of Lusantos, uh, we have here Lusamenu. Now, the other change here is that in the masculine and neuter, now instead of third person, uh, sorry, third declension uh, adjective endings, we're going to use second declension adjective endings. So really, I guess there are two differences uh, between the aorist and the middle participles. Uh, you change the voice indicator to men, whether it's first or second uh, aorist, whether it's masculine or feminine, all of those use the voice indicator men for the middle voice. And in the, uh, sec uh, in the masculine and neuter, you use second declension endings instead of third declension endings. So here is, again, don't memorize this, uh, but you can see the pattern. Here is a first aorist middle participle uh, example. And you can see in every single case, we have the sigma tense marker for the first aorist, the alpha connecting vowel, and then men as the uh, tense marker of the middle, and then perfectly regular second declension or first declension uh, adjective endings. And if we want a second uh, aorist middle uh, example, here we can see, again, a perfectly regular pattern. Uh, now we're using the second declension stem, uh, using the Omicron connecting vowel, and no sigma tense marker. All of that is normal for second aorist. And the only change we've made is to, to uh, use that men uh, middle uh, voice indicator right across the board. And once again, we're using the second declension uh, adjective endings for the masculine and neuter. So which adjective endings do we use for participles? In the active, we think 3-1-3. Three, masculine is third declension, feminine is first declension, neuter is third declension. If it's a middle participle, we think 2-1-2. Two, two. Masculine and neuter use second declension uh, adjective endings now, but the feminine still uses the first declension adjective ending. You can learn more about aorist participles in Mounts' Basics of Biblical Greek, and I've given you lots of uh, page numbers for the various places where Mounts discusses these participles in his third edition.